Welcome to FACT's webinar called Predator Protection for Livestock. Our presenter is Jan Donor. This webinar is hosted by Food Animal Concerns Trust. I am Larissa McKenna, FACT's Humane Farming Program Director, and I will be moderating this evening's webinar. Thank you for joining us. So this time I am absolutely delighted to introduce our esteemed presenter, Jan Donor. Jan is an author, educator, and researcher who lives on her small family farm in Michigan. Jan has over 40 years of hands-on experience using Livestock Guardian Dogs for predator control. She is also the author, uh, the author of Livestock Guardian Dogs, Guardians, excuse me, using dogs, donkeys, and llamas to protect your herd and the Encyclopedia of Animal Predators. We are incredibly lucky to have Jan with us today to share her, her experience and expertise, and she will be available to answer your questions later on in this webinar. So with that, I'm going to let Jan get started with her presentation. Jan, please take it away. Hi, Larissa, and uh, all the attendees that are here this evening. I am really grateful to FACT for sponsoring these webinars. This is the fifth one in the series that we've been working on um, that are concerned with the use of livestock guardian animals and um, non-lethal means of predator protection. And it's just been a great series and I'm just very grateful to them for working on it as well. Um, there will, again, there will be lots of information tonight and instead of taking notes, I would encourage you to download the slides tomorrow or view the webinar again later to study it more carefully, especially when there's, there's a lot of detailed information on the screen. When a lot of you were signing up, we noticed that um, a lot of you tonight had questions again about livestock guardians. And though I'm going to talk about them somewhat tonight, I also want to refer you back to the first three webinars that we did this fall. Um, they were focused on livestock guardians, both dogs, donkeys, and llamas. And then two of them were specifically um, aimed at, at dealing with training and selecting livestock guardian dogs and then problem solving as well. And they're all available on facts webinar page. And so um, that is just going to be a great resource to go back to again. So tonight we are um, focused on livestock. The last time we did this, we were focused on poultry. And we'll be looking at sort of the three prongs to this equation here. We, you need to assess the percent, potential threats in your area and around your farm. You need to identify predator damage when it occurs to try to figure out what it is that's coming after your livestock. And then you need to adopt preventive strategies to deal with the actual threats on your farm. Now, livestock, as we just on the poll we're talking about, generally regarded to be like sheep, goats, and cattle. Um, I would argue that llamas and alpacas have sort of moved into the category of conventional livestock these days. Full-sized full horses are primarily at risk from the largest predators, although smaller equines, especially the minis and ponies and things, are as vulnerable as a sheep or a goat to a predator. There's also growing demand for pasture-raised pigs, and young pigs are certainly um, vulnerable to a lot of predators. And we'll talk just a little bit about rabbits as well, because it's, um, rabbit raising is um, growing in popularity again, especially on homestead or family farms. And in addition to all that, much of our material night is also applicable to some alternative farming um, of raising livestock like deer, for instance. And I do know people raising deer that are using livestock guardian dogs and other um, measures we're going to talk about tonight. So predation. Intellectually, we all know that predation is essential to survival and essential to ecology, but that doesn't stop it from being a very upsetting event when you discover a killed animal on your farm. It can be a serious economic loss to your farming program as well. It could be a loss of important genetics to your herd or flock. And our response is usually anger. We're emotionally upset, and it's also a lot of stress. The problem is it's too late to do something about it. So key to reducing your stress is being proactive and adopting some of these techniques that we are going to talk about tonight. So many folks have observed that predation seems to be increasing, and they're right. It is. So how did we get here? Well, the big three, as I call wolves, bears, and mountain lions, were found throughout the United States at the time of European exploration and settlement. But back in Europe, where these colonists were coming from, especially in England, Scotland, Ireland, and many of the other Western European countries, 
they had been pursuing predator eradication for centuries. The big three were gone from Britain and in much of Western Europe, the only place you might have seen wolves or bears were, was up in high mountain areas. And this was by the late Middle Ages. So when the European colonists arrived here, they found the large predators to be terrifying especially mountain lions, which they did not have experience with. So as colonization moved westward, extermination sort of followed along with it. So by 1870, there were no mountain lions east of the Mississippi River. And the eastern mountain lion actually is considered an extinct species. By 1900, wolves were limited to just the northern Great Lakes areas and up into Canada. By the 1930s, grizzlies, mountain lions, and wolves were only found in isolated pockets. The black bear population had been reduced and it had retreated into um, areas that were still heavily forest. So what are the reasons for our increased interactions today? Well, there's several. First of all, due to the large predator extermination and land change with farming and forestry, um, there was a huge expansion of coyotes, but also many other small predators as well. Raccoons, skunks, foxes, opossums, they've all greatly expanded their ranges because it was empty. After some of the larger predators received legal protections, obviously their populations began to um, grow again, and they're returning back to their former ranges. There's also been a decline in trapping, and trapping was one way that some of the predator numbers were kept down. Also, with climate change, many birds and animals are expanding northward and moving upward up slopes where snowpack isn't as dense as it used to be. And finally, many of our predators have become habituated to human environments, to human presence, to our food sources, even in urban environments. So for all these reasons, we are dealing with much more predation than we did just a few decades ago. So relative threats. I always say the, the big three get all of the press, wolves, bears, and mountain lions, but by far the major predators of stock are coyotes and dogs. Coyotes are the greatest threat to stock across this country, and you can see in the dark purple area, that's coyote predation. Dogs are also the most dangerous animal in North America to humans. They're responsible for 20 to 30 deaths each year and thousands of bites, which is far more than any wild predator. The National Agricultural Statistics Service, which is abbreviated as NAS, N-A-S-S, -S, issues yearly reports on sheep and cattle predation, although not very much on goats, and it's broken down into regional locations, and then it shows regional differences with the type of stock, specific predator loss that's happening, even the control methods people are using. This keeping track of predator control methods and their success over time is revealing to us what's working, and that's what's important for us. So obviously the list of possible predators is large. Your large and small stock that you might have on your farm are obviously um, vulnerable to um, the larger predators that we see. And then smaller animals on your farm, but also newborns, even new cattle, um, lambs, they're also vulnerable to the smaller predators that will be around on our farm as well. And rabbits are very vulnerable even to hawks and um, owls, things that would normally be a poultry predator. So we're going to take a little whirlwind tour of the, the predators that we are dealing with here now in the United States. So there are some differences of scientific opinion on whether all wolves are one species or they're separate species. Um, but irregardless, you can see the difference in the two types that we see here in the United States in the purple area, that's the Eastern wolf. And they never left the Great Lakes area. They were always up there. Elsewhere in the United States, out in the West, those wolves either moved down on their own or were transplanted down. There are a few tiny pockets um, of wolves, like red wolves and Mexican wolves otherwise, in the country. Today, wolves only occupy about 5% of their original range, which is about 5,600 animals in, se in some separate populations. Although occasionally we're seeing transient wolves. If you live in their area, they are no doubt a serious challenge for you, but for most of us, they are not an everyday predator. On the other hand, the coyote is. 
they were originally found only in the plains. They were completely unknown in the East. In fact, Meriwether Lewis first described them in 1804 during Lewis and Clark's expedition out West, and they didn't know what they were. They thought they were a type of wolf. So the coyote took great advantage of the elimination of wolves and the changes in land due to deforestation and started moving. <laughs> By the early 1900s, they were moving east and west. By the 1970s and 80s, they were moving into the southern states. My husband grew up in rural Indiana in the 1950s and 60s, and he swears they never saw a coyote. And that's probably true if you lived in southern Indiana. It's, this is a new problem. They've adapted everywhere. And the interesting thing that we find out is that coyote predation is sometimes even higher in the more recent areas, especially the southern states. And I think part of that is due to the fact the stock owners have not been prepared for what's happening. Coyotes vary in size um, regionally. They're sort of subspecies, except they all mingle as well, too. And we don't even know the size of the population of coyotes in North America. It's certainly in the millions. But what we do know as a result of many studies is that killing coyotes is not the solution. A more recent development is the eastern coyote, sometimes called the coy wolf, although biologists don't like that name. And it's a mixture of coyote, wolf, and domestic dog in varying percentages. They can weigh up to 60 pounds, which is much larger than the coyote that we find in the west, who is much smaller. Um, the greatest percentage of wolf is found in the eastern coyote that's way up in the northeastern part of the country. In some areas, coyotes tend to only be seen as single coyotes or maybe a pair. And in other parts of the country, they're able to form up packs because of food sources. So that also affects on you on your farm with what you're dealing with with coyotes. So the other canine that you may be familiar with are the red and gray foxes, and one or both of them is probably found in your area. Um, the red fox originally was native just to the northeastern part of the United States, but it has greatly expanded its range and moved across Canada. It's found now in most of the United States except the arid southwest. And then more recently, with reforestation, the gray fox is moving back into northern areas and closer to um, urban spots. And for those of us who haven't dealt with the gray fox before, uh, while you can fence out a red fox, the gray fox can climb trees, straight up trunks, can jump between branches and drop into animal enclosures, which makes it a different fox to deal with. Mountain lions originally were found everywhere from the Yukon to Chile and every type of terrain from the high mountains to deserts to tropical. This was the animal that terrified settlers more than wolves or bears because it, it, it appeared to be an exotic, frightening animal to them. And they were pursued with eradication, but they are moving back. The light yellow area on this map is where they have moved back in. We're seeing confirmed sightings, but other solitary sort of um, singletons are also being spotted pretty regularly further east. I know there was one in Kentucky this summer. We've had ones in lower Michigan. And it's something that as we seem to come in contact with them more in suburban and nearby recreation land um, that we're also going to have to think about. The bobcat is usually a very secretive animal. It's found all throughout the United States, except the heart of the Midwest and coastal regions of the Mid-Atlantic and some New England states. They don't prefer flat open cropland or deep snow, so it's keeping them out of some areas. They are the most dense in the Southeast and increasingly are being seen in suburban and urban areas. The bobcat's relative is the lynx, and it was always primarily found in areas of coniferous forests with deep snow, which they need for denning. And as that snow, winter snow line is moving northward, the bobcat's moving up into the lynx territory, and we are starting to see crossbreds between the two. Now, just um, a note about grizzly bears, <clears throat> although we hear about them a lot, their numbers now are probably only about 1,500 to 1,800 in the lower 48 states, and they only live in four small protected locations in Montana, Wyoming, Idaho, and Washington. If, if you live in those areas, they certainly are something that you have to deal with or when we vacation or, or 
have recreation there. We do too. Black bears, however, are found much more widely in the U.S. Interesting thing about black bears is the original population was estimated to be about a half a million at the time of settlement, colonization from Europeans. But despite the, re, the retreating areas of forest cover, the population is now estimated to be higher than it was then and probably up somewhere around 900,000 black bears, but they are more concentrated in, in areas than they were before. Um, <clears throat> part of this is also as a result of the loss of wolves and mountain lions as apex predators. And we're seeing transit bears in other locations where they're starting to wander away as singletons. Um, they do, don't do well without dense tree cover that they can retreat to. So this will probably limit their spread into some areas. But we do know, on the other hand, they habituate to human sources of food, which is bringing them into closer contact with us. And finally, the smaller predators, like I said, are a danger mainly to newborns. Um, raccoons, opossums, weasels, fishers, mink, badgers, skunks, even rats will all prey on newborns. And of course, they'll kill small animals like poultry or rabbits. Um, rats are also the prey of larger predators. And so they attract larger predators into your buildings and areas of the farm if they're allowed to multiply unchecked. And they, these small predators, the challenge with them is their size. They can fit through fencing really easily, but they can also, many of them either climb or reach through fences or dig under fences. And those are a different set of considerations. Birds of prey are also a threat to livestock, mainly newborns, sheep, goats, pigs, calves, because they will peck on vulnerable areas like the eyes or the nose or um, the rectum hooves sometimes. They occasionally attack older calves or sheep, like especially laboring mothers, and they're attracted to the afterbirth or fresh droppings of calves. So they're opportunistic scavengers of other carcasses that you might find killed on your, on your property, but sometimes blamed for probably um, a case where they're just scavenging. Eagles are a bigger challenge because they can carry away up to a three or four week old lamb or kid. Black vultures, as opposed to the scavenging turkey vulture, are now found from the southeast up into the lower Midwest and northern Atlantic areas, and they are also expanding their ranges. The groups will sur surround birthing animals, and they're a real threat to newborn calves and lambs on pasture. And um, I know cattle people that have started to adopt livestock guardian dogs just because of their black vulture problem. Crows, ravens, and magpies will also peck at animals' faces or eyes or sores. Sometimes they're attracted to laboring mothers. So these can also be threats on your farm. <clears throat> Something we don't often consider are feral pigs. They're the descendants, obviously, of domestic pigs that were turned loose to forage, and also from some wild boars from Europe that were released for hunting or escaped, and they've hybridized between the, the two in some areas as well. And the population has exploded. It's now estimated to be about four to five million in the country. Now, besides the serious environmental and crop damage they can cause, they're attracted by birthing smells and afterbirths, and they will sometimes chase animals. They will kill lambs or kids or newborn cats and they will sometimes carry off or consume entire carcasses. If they are a problem in your area, you often need to aggressively fence them out. Livestock guardian dogs can be helpful, but the, the bad news is they are not at all discouraged by many of the fright techniques that we use to ward off wild predators. So how do you figure out what's in your neighborhood? <clears throat> First, I always recommend the NAS regional statistics because they break them down regionally and state and looking at what animal predators have been have been attacking other people's livestock gives you an idea of what's happening in your state or your area. You also should see what your state DNR, AG and extension services um, is putting out there. Read your local county and city area websites. Um, listen to local news and online neighborhood groups. Talk to your neighbors. All this kind of word of mouth lets you know what people are seeing. 
Personal identification is also really important. And it, it's it's good to learn the common signs of predators in your area. Learn what the scat maybe looks like or the tracks. Trail cameras are enormously helpful here. They are, are, they are better and cheaper than they used to be. They store far more images. They can transmit to your computer in your house. And they're really useful to put um, near an area of fencing, maybe an exterior fence on your farm where you know you have wooded area or a brushy area or something where a predator is likely to come up and that way you can monitor if things are coming up near your fences or outside of buildings it's another good place trail cameras are, are turning out to be a really good tool nowadays then there are factors that have affect your personal risk on your farm beyond just this knowledge of what predators are in your area so do you have terrain on your farm or next to your farm that will attract predators? And it's things like brushy cover, hilliness, water sources, especially in arid areas, nearby forested land, undeveloped land, wilderness areas, those are all attractants. Um, you need to look at the attractants on your own property and that can be open water again. It can be sources of food, um, garbage, animal feed that might be spilled or left out if there's a lot of wild prey on your farm, if there's sheltering areas where these predators can den up or raise litters. You also need to consider the seasonal changes for predators at times when they are feeding litters, when there might be a drought, when there's a harsh winter. These things are going to increase your risk on your farm. You need to think a little bit about future movements, especially if you're planning fencing or figuring out what pastures you're going to be able to use at different times. Predators are extending ranges and looking at where we're starting to see the, you know, singletons coming through is kind of an indicator of what may happen in the next decade or two. Finally, you need to examine your own husbandry practices. And what this means is, is there a lot of human presence on your farm or is, are, are the, the, people who live on the farm gone from the farm, maybe doing jobs during the day. So there's not a lot of human presence. Do you use close pastures to where you live and where you're active and busy, or do you use remote pastures? Are you in the habit of bringing animals back in closer sort of at night, closer to your barn or paddock at night to pen them, making them safer because of their fact that they're adjacent to you and where there's lights and noise? Um, do you tend to use pasture birthing or do you offer greater protection by using maybe lambing pens or something? Do you free range poultry? If you do, that's an attractive thing to predators. They come looking for your birds and they may, you know, stumble upon something else. Unprotected hay or crop storage can entice in predators as can rodent population on your farm. So we need to know when most attacks are likely to occur. And of course, things like dust through dawn, these things are, are common. Um, and the thing to think about here is it helps inform you which pastures, for instance, you might want to use during certain times of the year, um, where you know that you probably need to bring animals in closer at night. There are also some exceptions to these these ideas of a when most attacks occur. Predators like coyotes and raccoons will also hunt during the day, for instance, when they have litters to feed. Coyotes often attack in rainfall or fog. They make they take advantage of that that sort of gray dusky darkness to extend the time that they're out hunting. So the next st step after you've sort of, you know, created your own list of what predators you need to face is to identify predator damage if it does occur on your farm. And this can be a challenge. The victim may be gone. The animal may have died of a natural cause. Then there may have been scavenging after that. So you have to start sorting these things out. I like to say that um, you approach it sort of like crime scene investigation here. You have to gather your clues to help you determine if it was actually an attack or a natural death, maybe caused by an accident, if they were scavenging, if the, uh, the attacking animal was a domestic animal or a wild one. The sooner the better that you can take the observations, you're better off because there's, the scene has been disturbed less by scavenging animals. Even the your own animals that are in the same area will disturb the scene. Photos are always better than memory. Take pictures of wounds, the condition of the body, take pictures of the entire scene. Put an object or a small ruler in the photo to help determine the size of the tracks or any bite marks. Take um, a photo of more than one track. Maybe you can capture a whole track pattern because that's also helpful in identifying the um, predator.
Think about whether you heard anything. Look around to see if there were the signs of this of a struggle in the attack area. Is there any fur or wool? Is there blood spatter? Are there tracks? Look for feces. Examine the entire area because the predator may take um, their victim away some distance to consume them. Look and see how your other animals are behaving. Are they acting nervous or alarmed or are they acting normal? Do you smell anything? Sometimes you can smell a musky smell. Scavenging will always occur and this complicates your search for the culprit. And, um, but you begin your research after you've gathered your clues. I do want to bring up um, the usefulness of some field autopsy techniques. It's not a pleasant topic, but appearances can be deceiving and are sometimes complicated by scavenging. So sometimes in looking for bite or claw marks, you need to trim away hair or wool to see if you can find the actual bite or talon marks, for instance. Talon punctures are usually deeper than teeth and they're in a distinctive pattern with less crushing than a predator makes. You can measure the bite and that helps determine which size predator it was, if they are bites. There are some guidelines here that are useful to us. When bites or punctures are made to a living animal, there will be bruising or hemorrhaging. And you may need to remove some hide even at times to look underneath for the further damage. So record where the marks are found on the animal's body as well, because different patterns of attack indicate different predators. Remember that profuse bleeding can occur before death and right afterwards. And a natural death does not cause as much blood, but other fluids um, from the body. You also need to try to decide sometimes whether a lamb, for instance, was stillborn or whether it was a victim of predation. And there are some clues here too. They may still have soft membranes over their hooves if they were stillborn. If you can examine them, pink lungs indicate that the animal was breathing before death. Dark colored lungs all that will not float in water tend to be that it, this is a stillborn that never took a breath. Just like if there is the presence of milk in the stomach, then you know that the animal nursed. So this is the chart from my book that, that we used to gather up our clues of damage ID. And I don't expect you to be able to read it here, but it's illustrating the thought process you need to go through. We put a lot of work into this chart to try to help people match their clues to the likely suspects um, and the more specific patterns of attack and signs that you found. Things like time of attack, um, specific damage to the animal, teeth, talon, claw marks, and other observations and things. Once you have narrowed it down to a suspect or two, this is when you do a little bit more research in depth because you want to learn maybe a, a little bit more about their behaviors, a, more about um, the method of kill, if that's relevant. You may need to match up tracks or look at scat or something else and the, this, is, for example, was from my book on, and it's coyotes, and it helps you identify um, and match up those characteristics as well. And there are other guidebooks out there for predators that will help you as well. So this is probably um, a very emotional topic for a lot of people. This is when a, a dog is responsible for the deaths. And as we know, especially if you have sheep, this, this is a common problem and a terrible problem. Dogs do tremendous damage, much more than a predator does. And also it's coupled with the fact that the owner of the dog usually doesn't believe that their pet is capable of it. Um, it's easy to confuse the tracks with coyotes. There are a few slight differences, which um, you can see if you look up charts. I have a chart in the book as well. But something that tends to be a giveaway is that your stock is going to show much greater signs of distress and many more injuries um, when attacked by a dog or dogs. And they tend to be just wild damaging in injuries as opposed to a purposeful attack by a predator. It helps to have a plan of action ahead of time and to know your legal rights in this situation. And it, they do vary by community. I will say confrontations with owners don't often go well. If you call or confront them, the owners may remove evidence or bathe the dog or do anything before you can get authorities out there to investigate. This is what you should do if you come 
upon a dog attack or shortly thereafter. Don't chase the dog. It turns out if you chase the dog, they're more likely to run in weird directions. If you can follow calmly, they tend to go home. Take photos of everything you can. If you can capture the dog, record all the tag information and call the authorities, not the owners. R write down complete descriptions, take pictures, photographs to document the the entire attack, even if you can't narrow down which dog it is, and call the authorities because you want to establish a pattern with authorities of a problem dog in your neighborhood as well. So after all this sort of dire news and uh, discouraging discussion, we need to take a look at the positive protection strategies that um, you can adopt that will help you on your farm. So what works? This has been documented by NAS, and these are the techniques that are proving effective with the highest rate of use and the most successful rate of use at, in order here from top to bottom. And these are the things that we are seeing that are making a difference when you adopt. They are also best used in combination, and we are gonna take a quick look here at all of these things. Another, um, source of information is UC Davis Rangelands Predator Hub. They've developed their own chart, somewhat similar to the one I just showed you from NAS, according to their research in which they also talk about which prevention techniques you can use against which predators and are proving to be very successful or moderately successful. So this is another um, good source of information to take into consideration. So we're gonna take a look at them. First thing is fencing. Fencing is always your first line of defense. There are two types of fence, exclusion fencing and drift fencing. And these are both examples of good exclusion fencing. Unfortunately, what most of us have on our farm is drift fencing. And it was um, designed to keep livestock in. Much of it was designed before we had the greater predator pressure that we have today as well. Exclusion fencing is designed to keep predators out. Um, wire mesh or woven wire with narrow spaces, multi-strand electric closer together near the bottom, combination fencing, sometimes with mesh and electric to increase the height, combinations of electric and non-electric high tensile wire. These things can all work really well as exclusion fencing. So as I said, many of us inherit drift fencing and it can be improved. If you have something like board fencing, you can add woven wire. Um, you can add livestock panels in some areas. You can add extra electric wires between a, a fence that maybe only has barbed wire or high tensile wire without electricity. Um, you need to fill in gates, which are often vulnerable spots because they have big, especially if they're pipe gates, they have big holes in them. You need to fill in around gates so predators can't slip through. You need to think about underneath some, some places and you need to fill in gaps, especially water gaps where you cross um, water. And I just want to mention here, a lot of people think chain link is somehow going to be more effective. And the fact is dogs and a lot of other predators can easily climb chain link. There is a, a no climb horse fencing, which also works just excellently because nothing can climb that. Fencing is expensive. I always tell people build the best fence that you can afford, especially around critical areas. And it's also important to know what your threats are so you choose wisely the type of fencing that you need. And some of that consideration is the spacing. Now, in reality, um, animals like coyotes, wolves, bobcats, dogs can jump six feet and you probably can't build a six foot fence. But if you have 42 inch fence already, you can add more height with electricity and that's going to discourage them. This, the chart here from Red Brand Fence is showing you the spacing that's recommended to keep out predators um, and it's closer to the bottom and this will work equally for wire and wire mesh. Um, six inches will, keep out, tend to keep out most coyotes, four inches spaces will tend to keep out most foxes, and two or three inches will keep out smaller predators, except weasels, which can go down to about uh, one inch and squeeze through something. Um, a seven wire permanent high tensile electric fence with wires spaced in this way will work. Adding height will work. The um, If you have wolves or uh, 
that's when you're going to tend to need more electricity up higher. And the same thing with bears. You're going to need electricity, which is actually the best way to deter bears. Electric wire is extremely useful um, for improving fencing that you may have. Um, Electric scare wires are sometimes offset or standoff or trip wires around the outside of the fence will keep off a lot of predators. You probably want to set them about six to eight inches high outside of the fence and um, six to eight inches, excuse me, outside of the fence and about six to 12 inches above ground. You can increase the height of a fence with electric wire, which will help prevent climbing, which many predators and dogs can easily do. You can consider using fladry on a, a poorer fence that needs improvement, especially around um, lambing or kidding or calving season. Predators do habituate to fladry. It is most effective with wolves or coyotes, um, but it, it can last for up to 60 days and it makes it useful during the vulnerable time when maybe you have pregnant mothers or newborns in a field. It's also portable and temporary and doesn't require much pre-planning. Um, it can be further strengthened with the addition of an electrified line and this combination is called turbofladry and turbofladry is more expensive but it's it seems to remain effective against the predator for at least three or four times as long because the electricity is added into it. Fladry and turbofladry can be difficult to find on the market. Some people make their own fladry, but you can also contact your wildlife or agricultural agencies um, and ask them if they have sources. Sometimes if you're near an, a Defenders of Wildlife office, they have a program for trying to uh, provide fladry to farmers, ranchers. Coyote rollers can also improve a fence. Um, either commercial or homemade, and it obviously prevents the coyote from getting a grip and climbing over the top of the fence. This is not a solution probably for a large area. People tend to use it more in a high risk area or a, an area that they really need to try to fence the coyotes out of. Aprons and overhangs are also a way to improve fencing. Uh, obviously, aprons can prevent digging underneath a fence and the overhangs, which can be made of like angled electric wire or mesh, will help keep a predator from climbing up and over. And finally, I just want to say avoid landing spaces. Um, flat surfaces are attractive sometimes on the top of a fence, but they actually provide this landing surface that's just like saying, well, come on up and stop here. The second most effective thing after fencing is the use of livestock guardians and specifically livestock guardian dogs, which are more successful than either llamas or donkeys. Um, livestock guardians are a group of specific dog, dog breeds developed for this work and trained appropriately. It's not a job any dog can do. They were developed to work with sheep and goats and cattle. They can be successful with alpacas at well. They're sometimes used with deer or horses. Um, if you're keeping pigs and Dogs and pigs sometimes not, are not a really good match or rabbits in cages or tractors. Dogs can patrol around outside of those areas. Guardian donkeys and llamas are used less frequently than livestock guardian dogs. They're not as successful against large predators or packs, but they are useful for some situations and some people. And as we said earlier, we've done three webinars specifically on the use of livestock guardians, and I would refer you back to that if you want more information. Related to this is um, the use of mixed beast grazing. Smaller homesteads often do this just out of necessity, milk and beef cattle together, some sheep, goats, maybe even hogs. A flurd is a method of purposefully bonding cattle and sheep to each other for the protection of the sheep. It's also a value to keep maybe a few more aggressive or horned animals in with your stock, sheep, goats, or cattle. I know people with horned cattle feel like they are are more able to protect themselves and also the other animals that um, they're in a pasture with. Mob or rotational grazing, either of these techniques also offers some protections. Because density is protective, it's kind of like a large, large animal herb. If you're using rotational grazing, your stock is probably more dense in a, a specific area. There's usually more human presence when you use one of these grazing methods as well because you're moving the fences every so often and moving the animals. It's easier for livestock guardians to protect and humans to supervise rather than stock that is spread out farther. And predators don't habituate to your other disruptive or adversive methods that you're using because you're constantly moving the actual location and the fence and the stock. 
The third most useful and productive uh, tool is to do something that improves your housing or the use of night penning or close protected areas for calving or, or lambing during vulnerable times. Many people use nighttime corrals um, to keep livestock in a smaller area, making them less vulnerable to coyotes. If you're so, uh, even out on the range where the animals are using much larger pasture size, moved into a smaller area, maybe with the use of portable electric mesh fence, keeps them concentrated, easier to watch. Many farmers move animals back in closer to the farm center or their house where they can keep uh, an eye on it as well. A coyote-proof corral or a paddock fence and night illumination makes this kind of option even more secure. And just very quickly, if you happen to have lion pro mountain lion problems, the true mountain lion safe fencing and housing has to be very robust. It's probably not practical for large areas and tends to be used in more concentrated areas. You have to have a, a firm roof over any pen that will support the weight of a mountain lion. So this is not a broad solution, but it can be a solution for someone with, with dairy goats or something, for example. If you are protecting from bears, as we mentioned before, electric fencing is an excellent way to keep them out. Beekeepers use them to keep bee, uh, bears away from groups of hives. Even electric mesh works with bears. Um, you also need to consider that you need bear-proof latches, even those electrified scat mats. I know people have to have more robust electricity around a cabin or something where someone's not living year-round to, to keep a bear off of it. I wanted to talk just a bit about pastured rabbits because um, it, it's this is a thing that's growing in, in popularity and people are wanting to get them out on pasture. This was done more in the past in fenced rabbit colonies and we moved away from this. Julie Engel is working on a 100% pasture-based system that's called Coney Garth. It utilizes movable housing and electro mesh paddock fencing. And I would refer her to your video, which you can find on YouTube, to, to, for, um, to see how she's doing this and how you're moving um, the rabbits so that they constantly have fresh grass and plants to eat. Another option is to use rabbit tractors, either a secure hutch that's moved around or just a movable tractor. You need to make this out of one inch hardware cloth on all sides, even the floor, um, to prevent weasels from getting in. Another thing that's growing in popularity is pasture raised pork. Um, obviously pasture is a, a nutritional supplement in a healthier living environment, although quite often pastured pork needs some additional food as well. In general, sows can be good protectors of their piglets, but sometimes there are too many piglets or the area is too large or the predator pr pressure is too difficult. And if you're raising piglets or wieners without sows, they are at risk until they're about 60 pounds or so. People who are keeping the smaller or almost mini pig breeds, obviously they need protection even longer. Dogs are actually the primary threat to pigs, followed by coyotes. Um, foxes, raccoons, ravens will also prey on young piglets. Depending on the size of your area, good perimeter fencing um, needs to be contained at least three feet tall to keep the pigs in. Higher if your predator is something that's going to get over three feet, as we've talked about before. Wire mesh or livestock panels, electric scare wire inside and out will keep the pigs off the fence and also things, um, the predators from the outside of the fence. Um, something that is mesh or livestock panel is more visible than just electric wire. Some people use movable electric hog net for rotational grazing. Now I get this question frequently about whether or not livestock guard dogs can be used with, with pigs. And the reality is pigs have a different social structure than other livestock. So it's kind of a, a can be a constant challenge. I know in some situations the dog and the, the family's homestead sort of pigs seem to be able to coexist. But in many situations, pigs and dogs don't work out well. If, if the dog acts as a good livestock guardian dog should and 
walks away from an aggressive act from the pig, the pig will often continue to harass it. If the dog retaliates or defends itself, things can easily escalate. Dogs can do a lot of damage to pigs, and pigs can be quite aggressive with dogs. Um, so it, it's just something that I'm very leery of, and I don't think it works out, especially with adult hogs like boars and sows. Smaller breeds, younger pigs on homesteads may be fine with livestock guardian dogs. They're not usually used with commercial production. And obviously, if you're going to use a livestock guardian dog, you need a good perimeter fence. Another thing to do is to have the dogs outside patrolling the area um, that the pigs are on pastured. As we're going through the list of things that are helpful tools for you in predator protection, your, your husbandry techniques are also things that can um, affect your predator you know, desirability on your property. Obviously, human presence is really important. This is the oldest traditional tool of a shepherd um, that he's out with sheep or goats. Um, range riders were out moving cattle on on large areas, either open range or pasture. These things today, these regular visits and lots of observations do have an effect in deterring predators. Range riding and going out or shepherding, you monitor your livestock for signs of distress that you might, you'll catch something sooner that they seem to be distressed by a predator in the area. It helps keep the livestock in closer herds rather than spreading out. And you can also yourself monitor predator activity in order to move livestock away from areas. And it's just this whole idea that the more human presence there is out amongst your animals, the more the predators in your area will be aware of it. The other thing that's important is to cull elderly or diseased animals and to remove carrion because these are predator attractors. A healthy herd reduces predator attractions, maintaining a clean environment. And I know in some areas on the range, producers are banding together and um, regularly going out and trying to remove carcasses as well because they know it is attracting predators. Something else that you have to do that's sort of aligned with this idea of good husbandry, it's part of it, is, is dealing with habituated animals and hazing the animals that do or are becoming habituated. Habituation occurs when a wild animal stops responding to frightening sounds or human presence. Easy access to food is often an important factor, and any predator can habituate. We, we have trouble with coyotes, but even smaller predators can become aggressive and demanding if they're fed or encouraged by people. So this brings up the importance of hazing. Hazing is just to discourage a predator, and it's not just coyotes. In a closer neighborhood, it's important that all the neighbors do it because you're trying to make your environment less friendly to the animals. Other members of your family need to do it if you're if you're being bothered by habituated animals. Haze if this wild animal begins to approach you or if it begins to be seen regularly um, in your yard, close up to your house, your neighborhood, and it doesn't run away. Don't haze ill or injured animals or ones that seem unusually and strangely aggressive because they may be ill or animals that are already at a safe distance and are just observing you. We're talking about animals that are coming in too close and showing no sign of fear. And you need to be careful if it's a large group of coyotes, for instance. Um, in, in that case, it's probably not good to be hazing. Some people also combine this with the use of water, like from a hose or something. And this is tied into making your farm or your property less desirable to animals. For instance, you, you need to think about your landscaping to try to improve visibility. And this often means clearing your line of sight along fence lines. It, it reduces the areas where um, predators can hide before an attack. And it also allows you to monitor it better. Remove brush or other cover where, pre where they can hide outside your fences and creep in close or your buildings. Think about limiting access to buildings in areas around your farm, even if your livestock isn't there. So make sure doors are secure to outbuildings and garages and, and cover all the openings in ventilation um, 
window wells, porches, underneath porches and things, because these are all providing hiding areas for animals. Obviously, overhanging branches and perching sites too close to where vulnerable animals are a problem. Not allowing wood, rubbish, stuff like that to pile up and also create hiding places or to allow rodents to live, which then attract predators as well. If you're in an arid area, open water will attract predators. You also need to pay attention to landscaping plants at times. If you are planting things that are extremely attractive to deer, other predators will follow behind because they're preying on the deer. You need to think about how you're managing your animal feed and your food waste. If the best thing is not to feed wildlife at all. If you do use bird feeders, use good strategies like baffles and clean up the ground underneath and hang suet and feeders 10 feet high or more and remove them in the summer if you have trouble with bears. Try to feed your pets inside whenever possible, not outside. Leaving dog food outside for or cat food outside is going to attract animals in. Same thing with water if it's an attractant. Don't leave grain food out for your animals that's not consumed fairly rapidly. Make sure animal feed is covered and protected, clean up spills. And I even think about your human waste. Even compost areas can be extremely attractive to predators. Foxes and coyotes are also attracted into many fruits. And so clean up rotting fruit and nuts under orchards and things as well. Finally, fright techniques. The problem with fright techniques is that um, predators do habituate to them over time. If you're using them, it's helpful to change things up and move locations. If you're using them, use them in combinations with other things. It's best if they're randomized in some way or responsive to motion. Obviously, there's visual things and auditory things. It's actually been shown that music or talk radio is better if you leave a radio playing, like maybe near a night panning area or something, if it has a lot of bass sounds. Um, those variable light, sound, water sprinklers on motion sensors are also useful because they're behaving erratically and will frighten off coyotes and things. Um, you have to be aware that continuous night lighting can actually attract roaming dogs, and radios don't discourage roaming dogs either. I want to talk a bit here about preventing dog attacks um, because this is a farm problem. A livestock guardian dog is an excellent defense against dog attacks. As long as you have not allowed your livestock guardian dog to play with pet or neighbor dogs, it desensitizes them to dogs maybe being in the area of the farm or in the area of your stock. You want to make a big show of chasing them off, neighbor dogs, not tolerating them on your property so that your livestock guardian dog realizes you're not inviting them over to play. Even if you don't use a livestock guardian dog, it's advisable to not allow neighbor dogs onto your property. It's like an invitation to trouble. I believe in reporting roaming dogs that are threatening to your stock take photographs. And again, you're reporting this in order to form a record of complaints in the event that there is an attack and you can match up photographs or times. Don't allow unsupervised contact with your stock, even with your pet dog or with visiting dogs. Um, it's just a recipe for, for trouble. And obviously you need to confine a female dog on your property who's in heat very securely, but be aware this will you know, bring in um, roaming dogs. Finally, I wanna encourage you to learn more about the natural predators that share our environment with us, understanding how they live and what motivates their behaviors and how they fit into the greater ecosystem helps us achieve our goal of coexistence as well. And consumers value this idea of coexistence and they value the predators and they value our efforts as farmers to use non-lethal protection methods. So value added labeling is available to help you educate and market your farm products. And it is something that you should be proud of and your consumers, your people that are buying products for your farm will appreciate. I want to refer you to three of the three really good sources for more information on um, an, in depth on some of these tools and other good ideas for coexisting with um, 
predators. Defenders of Wildlife, they also, also offer a lot of grants for people that need to set up electric fencing, for instance, in certain situations, or use other techniques, and they're very, um, they can be very supportive to you. The UC Davis Rangelines Predator Hub has a lot of current research, up-to-date research on what's working, and they're testing out a lot of new ideas. And the same thing with ATRA. Finally, I want to uh, suggest that you visit my website as well. I have a lot of information about Livestock Guardians there on all dogs, donkeys, and llamas, links to lots of sources for more in-depth information on that, links to predator guides for specific areas and to dealing with specific large predators, as well as organizational researches, um, resources for assistance and grants and more. And so, Larissa, I think we're about ready for questions. Excellent. I think most of the, yeah, if you've been sort of keeping track, I, th I think most of my the early registration questions were about um, livestock guardian dogs. Um, I know there there's some questions about having rough, brushy country and how you're going to do intensive rotational grazing with that. And that can be a problem to be moving um, electro mesh type fencing for, you know, for rotational grazing if you're in really rough, brushy country. And um, that's a factor in whether or not you can adopt a method like that. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I No, not too many have rolled in. Um, so I'm going to ask people, and first of all, I'm going to say thank you, Jan, for that excellent presentation as always. Um, and we do have, you know, another 10 minutes or so. If folks do have questions. Um, We'd love to, you know, get you the information that you need. So you can feel free to type them into that chat bar that you see on the left-hand side of your screen. Um, so what's going to happen is I will read them aloud, the questions, and then Jan will, will, do, um, will do her best to answer them. Um, While we're waiting, I can answer a couple of livestock guard dog questions sure. that um, I've received if, well, until you see something else. Um, how best to train one, and I want to refer you back to the webinars that we did previously because we really tackled this sort of in depth and answered, I think, just about every question a person could um, conceivably think of. <laughs> Part of the problem with using livestock guardian dogs is this is not a tool that we are familiar with here in this country. Many of the colonists that came here did not use livestock guardian dogs. They weren't used in Britain at all. And so, and then we eradicated predators. We're now having to deal with predators and we're having to master this new skill. And um, there's no shame in understanding that we all had to learn. We all had to learn when we started using them about 40 years ago. Unfortunately, what's happened is a lot of myths and misconceptions and, and well-intentioned but not accurate advice is sort of passed around from person to person. And, and I just really would encourage people to go to the source look on my website, look in other reputable places for what we've discovered really works with raising them and training them as well. Absolutely. Yeah, Jan has a ton of good stuff. So I'll refer you to that website in my follow-up email and then also to all of the Livestock Guardian Dog webinars that we did um, present uh, last last fall and winter. Um, so we did have a question that we have a couple of questions that came in, but um, one, how deep should you bury a no climb fence into the ground for digging predators? Um, 12 to 18 inches and it needs to be angled outward some while it's buried as well. Some people bury straight down 12 inches to 18 inches, but angling out helps prevent diggers as well because they can get get a start you know so it's a couple of different um, techniques to that but it needs to get down at least that far I saw a question about barbed wire as well yes. barbed wire is not a very good deterrent to predators it's a really good deterrent to cattle <laughs> and things like that to keep them in a fence but it doesn't have a great great effect and most barbed wire fences need to be um, enhanced with some electric wire and electric wire on the top is a better deterrent than barbed wire on the top of a fence. Um, so along those lines, and this actually was something I was wondering, the turbo flandry that you mentioned, does the electrical charge travel down the flagging? How did no. that work? Okay. It's on the wire. Um, 
and I don't want to say no completely because people are doing a lot of research work in this area trying to improve uh, Fladry because it is a useful tool that can be set up quickly um, without much effort. And so it is possible that some people are creating Fladry that might um, create a shock. There, there's obviously work to putting up Fladry in terms of it has to be set up and maintained. The flags can wrap around themselves in really nerdy areas and things too. So Defenders of Wildlife has done a lot of research on Fladry, and I think I would probably refer you to that website where they're doing a lot of trials and doing a lot of testing. And they might have a better answer than I can come up with. Sounds good. Just so you know, we are getting a little bit of that reverberation feedback. Okay, okay. <laughs> um, so another question, let's see, about coyotes. Um, just the question of leaving them or, you know, trying to get rid of them. Um, should we leave them to st stabilize the, uh, the population? And do you have any useful resources that you can share about? Yes, yes absolutely. absolutely. Almost, Almost every, every research, research study, study that's, that's been done has demonstrated, has demonstrated that, that it is better to leave your resident coyotes, coyotes and teach them to stay, stay away from property, property. Um, um, through, through methods from methods livestock, from guardian, guardian dogs, dogs to fencing, to, to, to human actions. actions. If, if coyotes, coyotes are, are um, shot, 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 hunters or trappers are sort of willy-nilly, you open up the area around your farm to new coyotes who will move in. Then you're starting all over again. You're better off to, to achieve a sort of, you know, truce <laughs> and no man's zone with the existing coyotes. And, and I have, I, I firmly believe this is true after 40 years of dealing with this. My livestock guardian dogs speak dog language. And so the very fact that they are barking at coyotes and and bluffing and threatening at them if they come up to fences has a great impact over time. Even them, you know, urinating and defecating inside my pastures. This is dog language. And it and and they understand each other. Dogs and wild dogs understand packs and territories and stuff. I have had coyotes raise litters of pups right outside my pasture fences. And there's a lot of noise and a lot of dog barking and puppy <laughs> yipping and stuff. But no sh lamb has been and has been hurt because they the coyotes understand they're on the they belong on the other side of the fence and they teach their young not to hunt on your property as well adolescent coyotes that are not part of any kind of parent structure too because of hunting or trapping are more likely to engage in reckless actions and come in closer to human areas come in closer to a lot of things that all these problems just sort of multiply um there, I understand that occasionally there are problem animals, um, and and that's part of dealing with predators in our environment. But for the most part, you cannot be, we could not begin to kill all the coyotes that would we would need to kill to reduce this problem, and we're better off to set up zones in our farms that are discouraging to coyotes. And this is one reason the use of livestock guardian dogs has just exploded in the last 20 or 30 years because they are an effective tool against coyotes. Does that answer the question? I think so, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so the last question we have for now, and this is more also still about um, the dogs, but maybe, would you like to talk anything about breeds specifically that would work best with livestock since that's what we're, the larger animals um, we're talking about this evening? First of all, you have to stick to the recognized breeds of livestock guardian dogs. And, and some of these breeds we are not very familiar with because as I said before, we're this is this is not a part of our heritage. My grandfather did not have livestock guardian dogs on his farm in Missouri, and he had no need for them as well. My husband had didn't grow up with livestock guardian dogs either. This is a new thing for us. We know some of these breeds just because we're familiar with them, breeds like um, the Great Pyrenees, for instance. But there are a good thirty breeds that you can choose from, and they have different characteristics, but they all are similar and that they've been selected for centuries to have the appropriate instinctive behaviors to bond to your stock and to protect them against these uh, against predators um, 
there is a difference between the livestock guardian breeds that come from Western Europe, and this is in general, obviously individual dogs are different, but in general, the breeds that come from Spain, Portugal, France, and Italy, dogs like Great Pyrenees, Spanish Mastiff, the Italian Marima, are dogs that are a little more forgiving of human error, a little mellower, a little easier to get along with visitors that you might have to your farm. And I truly believe this is because they've been living in close contact with people in more populated areas of Europe for a long time. As you move eastward into Eastern Europe and Central Asia, those breeds have been dealing with serious predator pressure. They still are dealing with wolves and and bears and jackals and lots of things. And they tend to be a, a little quicker on the trigger, <laughs> I guess is the way of saying it. They're working out very well out West where the predator pressures are strong. People are using breeds like Akbash and Kongal and um, Central Asian Shepherds and um, Sharplanese and some of these other breeds that are a little more up to maybe dealing with these heavy pressures. But while I say that a well-bred dog of from any um, breeder who is selecting for good working traits, whether it's Great Pyrenees or a Central Asian Shepherd, will be a dog that um, will work against predators. Um, but there are some differences between them. It is not a good idea to get a dog that's a cross between a livestock guardian breed and some other breed we are familiar with on our farms, like Border Collies, like um, other hunting breeds that might be on our farm like like breeds even like a saint bernard's or golden retrievers or just anything you can think of because you dilute and mess up the necessary instinctual behaviors that allow livestock guardians to work so well and it's okay if you cross two livestock guardian breeds but crossing out to another kind of breed um that is not a livestock guardian is not a good idea and this is this a thing we all have to learn about which are really good livestock guardians breeds to be using. Does that answer the question sort of? Yeah, I know. I think that's great. <laughs> and I know. So, and Jen does have a whole additional book that is just about dog breeds, working dogs and, and farm dogs and everything. Is that correct, Jen? Yes. It's called farm dogs. <laughs> farm dogs. So there you go. <laughs> <laughs> Covers all the livestock guardian breeds. Exactly. There's, so someone did, and this will be the last question for this evening. Okay. It's another another um, guardian dog question, but American Staff, uh, Staffordshire Terrier. Yeah. Um, could they be likely to have predator tendencies if they bark when animals move around them? I, any, the any dog on your farm can serve as a watchdog, can serve as being, you know, protective against predators in general, just on the farm. Um, I have an English shepherd. She is really pretty good at, you know, running around and chasing off little things and an excellent watchdog, but she could not deal with a coyote or a pack of coyotes. And it's the same thing with some of these other breeds. Also herding breeds and terrier breeds tend to have high prey drive and high chase drive. And while that's useful to them in the work that they typically do, like herding sheep or chasing varmints and things like that. It's not good when you're trying to live 24 seven with lambs, for instance. Mm -hmm. So um, it could be a nice farm dog and many farm dogs are excellent watchdogs and they're protective against poultry. I mean, against predators, but they are not the dog you would choose to live with your flock of sheep 24 mm seven. -hmm. Mm -hmm. Perfect, thank you for that.